Hi, this is Pat Iyer with Writing to Get Business, and I have with me Laura Conklin, who is a nurse who lives in Michigan, who I met, oh, I don't know how many years ago, Laura? Long time ago. Long time ago. <laughs> Laura worked for many years as a legal nurse consultant with the state of Michigan to help look at the actions of nurses who were brought before the Board of Nursing. Laura and I have worked together on a couple of her books, and I wanted to have you have an opportunity to hear about how Laura put those books together and what they have meant to her as the author of those books. Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, because I love to explain why I did all this. First of all, um, I had been a nurse for over 50 years, and in those 50 years, I've worked in every field of nursing, and I wanted to share those experiences with new nurses and reminisce with older nurses who have gone through some of the things in school and in practice that I've gone through and seen all the changes in nursing. So I had this brilliant idea, and Pat had a class on being a master author for a book. And so I attended the class. And the first thing I told Pat was, I really wanted to write my memoirs. And Pat's response was, who cares? (laughs) Nobody knows you, which is true. Other than family, friends, and those that I taught over the years in nursing. So, okay. Then came the message of, what did you do in all those different areas? What did you learn? What can you pass on to other nurses? How creative can you get in reinventing yourself in a different situation? So that became kind of the source of my first book, which is Shocking Stories of Nursing, Memoirs of a 50-Year Nursing Career, which takes the reader from when I was very, very young and tore up my mom's sheets for bandages and bandaged my sister, did a good job and all the way through to my retirement, which in all honesty has been a hyphenated word, free and tired. (laughs) (laughs) It's just, you know, you think, oh, I should have put that in a book. Oh, I should have put that in a book. It wasn't hard to remember these stories because they are real eye-openers. And one of the things that I really wanted to share with not only future nurses, but attorneys that I work with. This is me. This is what I did over my 50 years of nursing. This is my work ethic. These are all the things that I've accomplished and I can accomplish things for you as well. And it's interesting to hear from those attorneys that have read the book and say, well, I I didn't know you did that. I didn't know you could do that. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what you can do when you have to. So that led me to book two, which I couldn't stop. I was bitten by that author bug. So after spending several years, about 16 years, working for the state of Michigan, the Board of Nursing, and reviewing allegations against nursing and giving my opinion whether there was a breach in the standard of care or scope of practice, I still had a lot of those records. I says, well, here's book two more shocking stories of nursing. What were they thinking? And that's exactly what I wrote. Kind of a story, a little bit of a background to some of these stories. And it's like, well, these were the decisions the nurses made at that point. Why? What else could they have done? Is it, um, nobody starts off the day saying, I wanna go hurt somebody, I wanna make a med error. So why does this still happen? It's a lack of attention. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book, to get that information out to nurses that are either starting their career or have been in nursing a while and have gotten sloppy. Soon as you deviate from that standard of care, it will bite you. And this is things that a lot of these nurses in my stories found out that, wow, yeah, I didn't know that had ramifications. They don't always get away with those little sneaky little attempts to cut corners. So that was the reason I wrote the two books. And of course, they were anonymous. I didn't leave 
anybody's real name in, although if you've worked with me over the years, you could probably figure out who I was talking about. But that's okay, because that's a relatively small group. But it's, uh, it was an interesting endeavor. And Pat, thank God, knows English better than I do. I tend to write very passively. I don't know why. It's just a thing with me. So Pat helped a lot with making it short, sweet, to the point, and understandable. And I think that's an important feature. When they pick up the book, it, ooh, you're the author. Yes, I'm the author. Uh, it's kind of hard to debate whether you really knew what you were doing when you wrote the book. Eh, it got published, people bought it. How bad can it be? So I've been challenged a few times in a deposition, whether, and it was interesting because one lawyer said, he extended the timeline for the depth because he wanted to get the book and read it. And I said, go for it. The judge said, no problem. If it'll sell a book, go for it. <laughs> and he was surprised to find that the very case that the deposition was about, that was on a plaintiff, he was on the defense side, had a very similar incident. And of course, it was very heavily leaning towards the plaintiff. It should never have happened, but it did. So it was interesting to see that kind of like, oh, if you're interested, buy the book. Well, mm -hmm. you'll learn a few things. <laughs> when you were writing your memoir, did you have notes from your career? Did you have a diary? Did you have anything that could guide you in terms of putting that sequence of events together? Well, actually, uh, when I started nursing training, I started a day-by-day -day diary, diary of a student nurse. Well, I fell apart about week two after assignments, et cetera. So uh, no, I really didn't keep a diary. These stories that were in that first book, you couldn't forget them. Even if you wanted to, you couldn't. Some of them, you just can't unsee them or you can't forget them because they were so memorable. So I kind of went by my CV looked at, oh, let's see, what memorable happened at this in this institution? Or all these things come back to you. Good memory, thank God. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions or advice for somebody who wants to write their memoir? Oh, yes. Don't, you know, there's a reason for it. Like Pat said, who cares? Nobody knows me. Well, yeah, I wanted to share the information. So when you look at what you've experienced over the years, what impact did it have on you? What impact would this reading this book have on others that want to follow in your footsteps? So think about that. If you want to write your memoirs, everybody who's worked at any length of time in any job has something, some memories they want to hang on to and share. So pick out the ones that are going to have the greatest impact on your reader. If you want to keep a diary, if you need to, that, that's good. I could have written that book twice as large as it was, but I quit while I was ahead and still made sense without rambling. And as you can tell, I can ramble being a teacher for a long time. It's not a problem. Uh, but, you know, getting that organized into your thoughts of why are your memoirs going to matter to somebody? Why, what is it that you want to preserve? What is it that you want to share? And I think those are the important things. My recollection from working with you is that it took a much shorter period of time to complete your second book than your first book. Is that something that you felt was also true? And if so, why was it a shorter period of time? Well, I kind of got the hang of what I was doing. <laughs> Seriously, I was going through some health issues. I want to finish it before I croak because I wasn't sure at that point. <laughs> But fortunately, I'm much better. So um, the data was there, it was all on my computer. So it was a lot easier to look at categories of where were these allegations against nurses coming from? Was it from physicians? Was it from patients? Michigan doesn't have a public health code, uh, or rather a nursing practice act. It has a public health code. And that's what the, uh, all the regulations for any licensed occupation, Michigan comes off the same page, literally. So it makes it a little more difficult when you compare things to standard of care. But since I had all that data, it was a lot easier to see, to you know, kind of group the classes. Was it med errors? 
Was it outside of scope of practice? Was it ethical issues? Was it legal issues? And once I sorted those out, then I could easily pull out the information and the cases that I had on my computer. So it didn't take as long to put together. And when you say you had the cases on your computer, were those the medical records or your reports or something else that you had kept? No, those were the reports from the investigators and my report, my opinion that I sent back to the Board of Nursing. There may have been some segments to nursing uh, record to the medical records or nursing records references, but for the most part, they were basically the questions that the investigator posed and then my responses to the opinions, my opinions basically on those responses and things like that. It wasn't the whole medical record, that would be impossible. Mm -hmm. What did you learn from the process of putting that second book together, which is the overview of cases that you were involved in for the Board of Nursing? Well, one of the things that struck me is how often this happens. I had maybe 50 cases of med errors. Okay, well, are med errors that common? Well, yes. Uh, well, how bad are they? Well, a couple of these ended up in death. So yeah, they are serious. There were so many in different areas, scope of practice, nurses that decided to go beyond what is for a registered nurse, okay for a registered nurse to do. Now, if you're standing next to a physician and you're in the emergency room and they decide that, well, we'd like you to you know, help me do this or help me do that and you pitch in, that's fine, but it's not TV. This is what, you know, you have to stick within the boundaries of your licensure. And a lot of these nurses in this book did not do that. And it was interesting, the comments I had received from attorneys, they said, I didn't know the Board of Nursing even investigates this stuff. I said, oh yeah, if a nurse is terminated in the state of Michigan for any reason other than attendance, it is investigated. Well, that gave them another source to look, well, what kind of nurse is this? Did she make errors in the past? Did she lose her license? Did she move from another state because of multiple errors? So all these things put together kind of help why I decided to write that particular book. So it's a, it's a heads up, be careful. You learn how to do it right, continue doing it right, no matter who's watching. If it's right, it's right. I think you're right. I think that the general public and probably the person listening to this podcast who is not in the nursing profession or healthcare profession might not know that there is a watchdog agency responsible for protecting the public from nurses or physicians or other healthcare professionals who make errors in judgment or make mistakes or, you know, for example, I'll, I'll ask you that. What are some of the common reasons why nurses come in front of the Board of Nursing? Complaints from families. Sometimes families don't understand that this is okay. One instance that comes to mind is a patient who was in a rehabilitation unit. Well, in rehab, it's a different philosophy. We don't do for, for the patient what the patient can do. We encourage them to do as much as they can do for themselves so they learn, get more strength, and can continue. Well, the family complained to the board that there was no nursing care given. They made him do everything he was that he couldn't do. They just forced him. Well, that wasn't the situation. Uh, another instance was a medication error that was perceived by the family as an error when indeed it wasn't. This was a 90-some-year-old grandma who fell, broke her hip, was in severe pain. When she arrived at the hospital, the daughter was concerned that my mom's very sensitive to everything. She's old. It's like, well, you know, nurses hit that, you know. So the physician ordered one milligram of morphine. Not a huge dose. Certainly within the parameters of an okay dose for the size and age of that patient. No allergies noted. Patient got one milligram of morphine. Basically did nothing. Two hours later, the nurse called the doctor and said, this isn't helping. He will give her one more milligram. So the nurse did. The patient fell asleep and proceeded to eternal rest. In which case the nurse complained. I mean, the, pa the, the daughter complained that the nurse killed her mom. No, she didn't. 
you know, so there was no, there was no basis for the allegation being substantiated. There was no error. This was perfectly okay, but it took a while for the physician to convince the daughter that at 95, you are not going to live forever. It's okay. So it's things like that. There are complaints because of rudeness. Bedside matter matters. Believe me, it matters a lot. Nurses are short staffed. Your patient doesn't want to hear that you had a call in, that you're short staffed, you're doing the best you can. They don't care. All they care about is their needs being met. So you do the best you can. Did you change your perspective on healthcare as a result of seeing all those cases? No, but it made me a hell of a better teacher, I can tell you that. <laughs> Because when I taught nursing, which I did for about 18 years, I brought up those cases. Here's the situation. What would you have done if you were the nurse? And it's interesting to see the variety of answers that your students gave you. It's like, well, I would have done the same thing or oh, no, I would have done that or I don't know what I would have done. Well, think about it because you're going to be in those shoes. And since I had seniors, <laughs> it's going to be in a very short period of time. You know, so it was a very effective teaching method for me, but did it weaken my love for the profession or my passion? Nah, not a bit. Nope, you do the best you can with what you've got to work with. And sometimes that's not always easy to figure out what you've got to work with. So you protect yourself. I think of the, the cases that I worked on when I did medical surgical nursing expert witness work and I was working on the weekends in the PRN pool in the hospital. And I would carry into the workplace some of those stories of cases that I had worked on. Mm -hmm. And I could see the nurse's eyes get real big and round. And uh, it looked like it was having an impact on their behavior. We have, because Laura and I are both legal nurse consultants, we work in a field where there are lots of stories of things that happen to people, sometimes because somebody's negligent, sometimes because that's just the way things happened and it wasn't anyone's fault. So we have a very rich story-based profession, which you, Laura, took and turned into a book to be able to educate people about some of the weak spots in healthcare and how sometimes people step in holes in those weak spots and bad things happen. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And it's, it's interesting when I was going over these stories to, you know, stop and think of it from the other side. How could this nurse have prevented this from happening? Uh, a one instance where this nurse really, really went out of her way in a nursing home. She had a patient who was on dialysis his family would drive him two, three times a week for dialysis. He had a port. And then they stopped doing that because they were busy. So they figured a shuttle service will help. They'll take care of him. He was very offended. He said, I don't want to live anymore. Nobody cares about me. So this was a night shift nurse. She put him in the day room, spent some time with him where she could see him across the desk and you know, turned on the TV and found a channel he liked to watch. And she just sit up a little while and watch TV, see if you can find something interesting, and maybe it puts your mind at ease and you can go back to sleep. Yeah, he agreed. She went on to pass her meds. When she came back, she found that he found a knife in that day room and opened his port. He was a full code, in other words, to be resuscitated. If there was a cardiopulmonary arrest, there was no blood left. He had completely exsanguinated. It was everywhere she couldn't even come near the patient. The family complained that the nurse didn't do anything for a father and he was a full coat. Why not? There was nothing to circulate. That was very obvious. But it's situations that happen whether you plan for them or don't plan for them. So you kind of think of, you know, this nurse spent a lot of time with this patient trying to calm him down and make him relaxed. But he had other plans. Mm -hmm. It happens. <clears throat> You brought up earlier about being an expert witness and the opposing attorney wanting to postpone a deposition so that he could buy your book. 
what advice would you have for somebody who's debating about what to include in a book, perhaps thinking about how it might come out in the future? Well, that is a very good point, because you do have to think, how is this book going to be perceived by other people who are reading it? You know what's in it, you're writing it. But how much of details do you want to put in the book? Is it too many details where it really grosses out your reader? Or is it not enough detail where they don't really know what you're talking about because they don't have the medical background you have? And these are the things that you have to sort out when you start thinking about, well, what is it? What's the purpose of the book? And what is it that I want to put down where the average reader is going to be able to get something out of it? There are nurses, if you if have a nursing topic, who will understand what you're saying, but your general public may not. So how do you clarify that? How do you make it simple without making it so simple that it's beyond what would be an impressive professional written book? I know that there are people who caution about what you put on social media, that social media never goes away. Never. I've heard that expression that you shouldn't put on social media something that you wouldn't want to see on a billboard. Yep. Letters that are 10 feet high. A book, from what you're describing in, in terms of the thought process, is even more permanent than a post on Facebook or on LinkedIn or a tweet on Twitter. And as an expert witness, you know that the opposing counsel is searching desperately sometimes for anything that they can use to discredit you. Other people who are writing books to share their expertise are not in the profession and have that question in their minds of, well, you know, if I express a strong opinion or I go out on a limb or I have incorrect facts and incorrect conclusions in my book, how is that gonna come back and bite me in the future? Well, I think you have any the, thoughts about that? Oh, yeah, I think what and it was interesting because when I first told one of the lawyers I work with closely and said, I'm going to write a book and he says, watch what you put in it. So you have to really stick to the facts and just the facts, because when you do that, it can be interpreted either way by plaintiff defense or if you if you and it's the same thing that I would do with depositions. If I reviewed a record, I would look at well, what would the what would the defense side think? You know, how would they approach this? And the same thing if it was a defense case, well, how would the, what's the complaint that the plaintiff's gonna make? The facts are the facts, they don't change. So when you're writing, you have to be very careful that you do that, that you stick to the facts of the case and let everybody make their own mind up as to what they think should have happened, shouldn't have happened, and interpret the facts as they are written. Change everybody's name, that's number one. <laughs> I would definitely recommend that. Mm -hmm. But other than that, yeah, the, and it's the same thing. You can't dispute the facts. If somebody gets burnt because somebody spilled coffee on them that was hot, they got burnt because they got coffee spilled, whether it's somebody's fault, whether it's nobody's fault, whether the patient himself knocked the coffee over, the patient was burnt, bottom line. And taking it out of the medical legal arena, what you're saying is making me think about the importance for the author who, particularly for something that's an issue-based position, to think about what the people on the other side of that issue, if it's two-dimensional and often issues are not two-dimensional, to think about how that issue could be looked at from another perspective and incorporate that perspective, or at least proactively refute that perspective when writing the book? I think it would depend on how big this book is going to be. And what the... <laughs> <laughs> you can write a pamphlet and do that, but when you come to 400 pages, it's a little, you know, you're really stretching it, trying to refute and rebuttal and everything else. But basically, I think. Uh, without getting too involved with opinions. You know, if you state the facts, let people draw their own opinions. When you start putting your opinion in, then, you know, you really have to look at, but 
the other side might see this this way. So, and it's difficult to write anything with that kind of balance because your reader is always going to have something in the back of their mind that's gonna interpret your data or what you wrote their own way, good, bad, or indifferent. So that does happen. And that's one of the things you have to kind of look at is both sides of that coin. I did a podcast with Randy Gage, who is a thought leader and a person who offers provocative positions on items. And I know that his position would be, this is my opinion. I'm going to share it. I'm going to put it out there in the world. His opinions are well-researched. They're well-founded. They're well-grounded. The whole genre of being a thought leader means taking controversial positions. In the medical legal arena, we have to have everything solidly backed up yep. so that we are from the perspective of being able to defend our opinions, we are on good, solid ground. When you're a thought leader outside of the medical legal arena, you can be provocative and then sit back and wait for people to say, I don't agree with that. Or that's not the way to look at it. And it stirs up attention, which is often what thought leaders want, is that attention. As expert witnesses, we don't necessarily want all that attack and that attention. We just want to go in, offer our opinion, and if possible, leave the stand without a rigorous, nasty, prolonged cross-examination. Mm -hmm. I'm setting the scene for the people who are listening to this who have never been in that hot seat known as being an expert witness. It's a hot seat, trust me. <laughs> it's a, hot it's a very hot, very hot seat. <laughs> oh. But you know, it's, it's both sides, but there's plaintiff defense, they all went to law school. It's a game. They know how to play the game. They know the rules of the game. If you've given enough depositions and been in enough trials, you know what those questions are. You know how they're going to be presented and you're prepared. But bottom line is you better know that case like it's your own mother because you can't take all those notes with you except for one pathologist who in trial would take all his notes and he'd simply say, uh, well, you know, I'm old, your honor. I, I got to put things down so I don't forget them. Now, both sides have copies of his notes and it becomes a free for all, but it's very interesting to watch the dynamics of that because in the discovery process, both sides know kind of where everybody stands. It's interesting. It's very interesting. You brought back a memory of watching a nurse on the case that I was involved in. She was the opposing expert. I always took my medical records to court in a binder, three ringed binder, indexed, tabbed. I knew exactly where to find anything. She had loose papers that were in no particular order on the witness stand. And the attorney in cross-examination asked her, well, where did you find that? And I still remember the flush that crept up her neck to her face. She was wearing a red suit jacket, which didn't help either because there was already red reflected on, on her face. And she turned beet red and said, I don't know where I found that. And it was a pivotal point where, and she lost her composure over that. The importance of knowing the record like she's your mother is what you just said. Yes. Is a critical one when you're in a high stakes position, such as testifying in a courtroom where there are dozens of eyes watching you become extremely uncomfortable. And that's easy to do. That's one of the things that you'll find that they do in depositions. So what are your hot buttons? What's going to really aggravate you so you say something stupid? Because that's the testimony they're going to try to elicit in trial. And uh, they're very good at it. That's their job, to protect their client. Uh, one of the ones, I remember one lawyer kept insisting I answer a question, yes or no. And I said, I, if I said I can't, then that discredits me as an expert. So I turned it around a little and said that question can't be answered yes or no. So the judge turned around and said, why not? 
oh, I had free reign to explain it for a <laughs> lengthy period of time. And I was very happy we won that case, by the way. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a, it's a game. And you know the players, you know how the game is played. And it's something that you have to be prepared with the facts in a case. The facts are the facts, and, the, and that's just the way it is. Well, let's recap, Laura. And would you share with our viewer the name of each of your books, what each of those books is about, and how our viewer or the person listening to the podcast can get copies of those books? I would love to. Uh, the first book is Shocking Stories of Nursing, colon, Memoirs of a 50-Year Nursing Career. And this takes you back from my interest in nursing all the way through to my retirement. <laughs> and it is available on Amazon. And the second book was More Shocking Stories of Nursing. What were they thinking? And this was uh, the memories of all the stories and allegations against nurses. And that's also available on Amazon. I said, I was telling Pat, I said, maybe I should write even more shocking stories of nursing, nurses versus doctors, patients, families, et cetera, and coworkers. But that's, that's in the future. This has been Pat Iyer talking with Laura Conklin. Her last name is spelled C-O-N-K-L-I-N. Laura is the author of two books. And I suspect, Laura, that third book is going to be coming out of your head and into your hands pretty soon because you clearly enjoy the process of sharing your stories oh, I do. and the insights mm -hmm. that you've gotten as a result of being involved in those stories. It is. It's been a lifelong passion and it hasn't ended yet. I've still got a lot of stories in this head I want to share. <laughs> <laughs> and for you who is watching this podcast on our YouTube channel or listening to it on the audio channels, if you've got stories in your head that you need help getting out, please feel free to contact me through my website at patire.com forward slash contact. We can discuss how to unearth those stories and share them with people who need to hear them so that they can improve their lives and gain new insights from the experiences that you've gone through. Thanks so much. So you want to be a writer? Well, let me tell you, this is a very interesting tax, but very, very, very rewarding. I worked with Pat Iyer, who helped edit my two books available on Amazon. Shocking Stories of Nursing, My Memoirs of a 50-Year Nursing Career, and More Shocking Stories of Nursing, What Were They Thinking? That looks at allegations against nurses in practice. I've been a nurse a long time. Because I was a nursing educator, I tend to talk a lot, I tend to write a lot. Pat sort of narrowed that down to grammatically correct English, where my sentences weren't so long that by the time you got to the end, you forgot what I wrote in the beginning. So that was a tremendous help in editing it. And in that editing process, made it clear, concise, and said what I wanted to say. That's a, editing is a very important part of writing any book because it's gonna be around a while. And so you want it to be a good piece of work that's going to exemplify what you can do. And that's an important reason for writing a book. Hi, this is Pat Iyer with Writing to Get Business, and I've just finished talking with Dr. Pat Ballone. We have been discussing some fascinating things related to her book on health. Pat, can you share with our viewer, what are some of the key subjects that we talked about in your podcast? Well, some of the key subjects that we talked about in the podcast were the book itself. And I always agree with an ancient Ayurvedic proverb that when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. And when diet is correct, medicine is of no need. So the idea in the book is to go to the root problem and what the cause of the problem is and identify what, why, and where, and how to begin your health journey so that you can live longer and better and healthier. 
And the other thing to remember is that knowledge is power, but knowledge is not power unless you're able to look at how to stack that information. So it's in a good order so that you can assimilate it, chunk it out, and you can do something about it. You can take an action step on it. So it's not why, it's what is it in my lifestyle and diet and environment that has caused the problem in the first place. And that's how I help people solve their problems. In our podcast, Pat shared lots of tips related to health. You want to be sure to tune in for her show. You'll get some practical information and you'll enjoy her style. And we did a lot of laughing on this podcast. We had fun. <laughs> and I think you will too. Thank awesome. you so much for being a guest on the show, Pat. And thank you to you, who is one of our Writing to Get Business podcast listeners.